are the White Cliffs of Dover. And this must have been the first bit of Britain that the Romans saw when they came to invade. In fact, they came in force in about May of AD 43. That wasn't the first time they'd visited the islands because Julius Caesar had come over a hundred years earlier, but he only stayed for a few weeks. In AD 43, the Romans meant to stay. In this series, I'm going to see what the Romans brought with them and what they left behind when finally they went home 400 years later. Why did they come? Well, partly for the glory, partly for the farmland and for the minerals like copper, lead and gold, and simply to trade. We'll be returning to those things later in the series, but for the moment, let's see how they established their first foothold. Forty thousand troops rode across the channel after some delay. Terrified of what lay ahead, they'd nearly mutinied back in Boulogne and were brought into line only by a direct order from Emperor Claudius. When it came to ship design, the Romans borrowed heavily from the Greeks, as they did in many areas of technology. Their galleys had banks of rowers on each side and they could also raise simple sails if the wind was in the right direction. They hadn't developed the single rudder, they used two steering oars, an idea that went back centuries. For the final stretch, they would have used smaller landing craft to get to the beaches of Kent. The first Roman feet actually hit British soil about here, a few miles north of Deal. But in fact, the sea has receded a couple of miles in the last 2,000 years. So where they actually landed, was here at Richborough, and at the top of the beach, to protect their supplies, they dug a ditch. This is the first scratch the Romans made on British soil. They dug the ditch to keep out all those marauding tribes, but in fact, they'd all gone home. There'd been such a delay with the mutiny in France that all these tribes had just got bored. However, they were seriously worried about these British tribes. Even Julius Caesar had said they were very frightening. <laughs> They made an awful lot of noise and some were covered in blue woad, but they were badly equipped and poorly disciplined. The Romans, by comparison, were well drilled and well used to a life of fighting. They had, after all, conquered the whole of the Mediterranean and fought their way north right up through Gaul, what is now France. The 40,000 men that invaded Britain were made up of five legions, that's 20,000 regular soldiers, and the rest were mostly conscripts from other Roman colonies. And it was these soldiers who made up the cavalry, horsemen from provinces in Africa and Spain. The Romans had the first professional army, and just like infantry today, each one of them was well equipped for a life of marching and fighting. First of all, he had sandals, very nice, cool in summer, and in the winter, they drained very quickly when you stood in a puddle. And underneath, you see you've got these lovely hobnails for terrific grip, really nice. And then moving up is the subligaria, the underwear, but I don't want to tell you too much about that. Then there's the armor, the lorica, as it's called. This is what the legionaries would have worn, quite solid, with sort of flexible bits at the, at the shoulders to give you some movement, but it's heavy and it's quite uncomfortable around the neck. It's probable the auxiliaries wore chain mail, but nobody's really quite sure. Then you've got the helmets, the cassis, which is, this one's very tight fitting, but very comfortable. And you'll see it's well designed. It's got a sort of ridge above the eyes to stop blows coming down. It's got bits around the jaws to stop me being bashed from the side, and a lot of stuff around the back of the neck to stop blows there. So it must have been reasonably safe in here. It's quite tricky to put your specs on, but that probably didn't worry them because specs hadn't been invented. Then we've got the weapons. There's this little dagger on the left here, but the one I like is this, the, the sword. It's a sort of short stabbing sword. Vicious thing. I wouldn't like to get on the sharp end of that. You can really give a, a punishing blow. The only real problem is that because of the armour, I can't see the scabbard. It's sort of around the corner a bit, and they must have cut their hands a lot putting the thing away again. Then we've got a javelin, and this was quite interesting because you, you would chuck this at your enemies like that, 
and the point, metal, is actually quite soft, so when it hits the ground it bends over, and when they pick it up and throw it back, it won't do you nearly so much harm. And finally, you've got the shield. Here, and this. Ugh. It's quite heavy, I wouldn't fancy carrying this for 50 miles of route march. And it's got a great big heavy boss in the middle, which A is for protection and B is for bashing your enemies on the nose. Uh, quite a useful bit of equipment really, but quite heavy. All in all, when they were marching, they carried about 30 kilograms, which is very much the same as the modern infantryman. If on their own they looked fearsome, then in battle formation they must have been terrifying. They would use a V attack for driving through enemy lines and the testudo or tortoise formation when arrows were raining from above. The Romans really knew how to organise, which made them good at military tactics and good at mass production. Of things. The troops pushed on through Kent and crossed the Thames near where London Bridge is today. From here they called the Emperor Claudius to come and accept the surrender, and when he arrived he brought something that really would have put the wind up the British. Imagine how terrifying it must have been to see five tons of elephant lumbering towards you, especially if you'd never seen one before. It's convincing evidence that Claudius really wanted to conquer Britain. It must have been a fantastic effort to get them into boats and across the channel, I guess he really wanted to lift himself up militarily onto a par with the mighty Julius Caesar. In fact, the Romans had been spooked by elephants themselves. The great Carthaginian general Hannibal from North Africa had marched elephants all the way up through Spain, through the south of France and over the Alps to attack the Romans on their home ground. So they knew how terrifying they were in battle. As they crossed the country, the troops quickly established forts like this one at Lunt, reconstructed on its original site near Coventry. It's home to a local group of history enthusiasts who parade as the 14th Legion. The Romans weren't just good soldiers, they were also brilliant engineers and builders, especially in wood. The gatehouse here at Lunt is a good example. The design of this gatehouse is based partly on the post holes that they found underneath it and partly on the designs on Trajan's column. It's a famous monument in Rome and it illustrates all sorts of military activity. At the top of this scene is the distinctive crisscross timberwork of a gatehouse. All the forts would have been made of wood in the early stages of the invasion before they had time to settle down and use stone. And the extraordinary thing was that all these timbers were probably prefabricated, cut somewhere else and brought here and simply fitted together. And there's lovely work. Just look at this. There's a cross halving joint here and a dovetail here. I guess these didn't always fit terribly well because probably the chap who cut this bit was miles away from the chap who cut this bit. But nevertheless, they were all planned in advance and there were blueprints for every type of fort. It was entirely different when they went away in the Middle Ages because then each building was different and every beam was cut as it was fitted in, which was much slower. And of course, there were no prefabricated, no plans for all the different sites of building. Now, when they wanted to join bits together, they didn't have nuts and bolts. They used enormous nails like this, and they didn't muck about. They had enormous nails. Absolutely terrific. Now, I reckon that if they hammered these straight in, they would have split the wood to pieces, so they must have drilled holes in advance. So the whole fort came as a sort of flat pack, and I bet the soldiers put them together faster than I could assemble some kitchen cupboards. This wasn't just any old fort, because in fact it became the horse training centre for the British colony. The Romans didn't bring all their horses with them, they used to pinch them from the neighbouring tribes. The Celts were very good at breeding them, but they didn't actually fight on them. They used to ride up to the battle, but then get off and fight on foot. So the Romans had to train the horses for use in battle, because they actually fought on horseback. And what they did was to ride them around and make loud noises and try and frighten them and wave spears in their faces.
The Roman cavalry were athletic and competitive. They trained hard so that man and beast, circling in what was called the gyrus, could outmaneuver the infantry, cut off their escape, and engage in close combat. Alan Larson is a rider skilled in Roman cavalry techniques. Alan, that was fantastic. I mean, I've never seen such action. I'm very glad I wasn't one of the infantrymen down here. Um, forgive my mentioning, but you seem to have left your stirrups behind this morning. Had a Roman cavalryman uh, did not have stirrups. Really? They hadn't been invented as yet, and it was to be some time yet before they were in use by the Roman cavalry. But frankly, the Roman cavalry don't seem to have missed them at all. Really? Because this highly developed saddle held them so firmly. Oh, you've got sort of lumps in front. Yep, yeah, the front and back arches. Right. Give me all the grip and hold I need to be able to carry up any manoeuvres. So you really don't fall out then? We have been known to fall off, but that's not the saddle's fault. Right. <laughs> no. No, well, I'm glad it's not me riding, because I'd fall off a whole lot quicker. So, tell me about the rest of your gear. How about the sword, for example? Right. Well, the Sparta is a longer version of the Roman stabbing sword. It's longer because I need that reach to get down to reach my targets yes. on the ground. OK. Yeah? Yes. And wouldn't it be easier if it was on the left? Well, if it was on the left... I'd have it there because I needed that extra length to draw it. Right. But because it's short enough to be drawn out like this, right. it can be worn on my right-hand side. OK. And how about your chain mail? This is sort of authentic, this stuff, is it? Absolutely. God, it feels every, horrible. Every link joined to every other in a painstaking process of manufacture. No, it gives me protection. Right. Also, plenty of flexibility. <laughs> yes. And a lot, uh, a lot more comfortable to wear than the Lorica Sigmata of the infantry. Yes, I imagine that. Isn't it heavy, though? No, it's not particularly heavy. And at the end of the day, most of the weight's been carried by this <laughs> fellow. Maybe we could watch while you do a bit more of this violent exercise. What's the horse called? This is Matador. Matador. Good luck, Matador. It was the artillery that ensured Roman success in many battles. Most of their weapons got their power from the torsion of twisted ropes. This is the onaga, which means a wild ass, so called perhaps because of its kick. It becomes a spring-loaded arm for lobbing stones at the enemy. Frightening, perhaps, but not as accurate as the more advanced ballista, which was like a large crossbow mounted on a stand. It evolved into something very sophisticated. And this artillery became the deciding factor as the Roman troops continue their progress across the country. The second legion of the Roman army swept westward under the command of Vespasian. So successful a general, he eventually became emperor. He captured the Isle of Wight, and then in the area that's now become Dorset, he came across a number of tribes like the Durotriges. Conquering these people was an uphill job, literally, because not only did they live in Iron Age forts on the tops of hills, but they protected those forts with deep ditches and colossal ramparts like this one, up to 15 metres high. And the Romans had to cross these ramparts to get at the great settlement of maybe a thousand people in huts on top of the hill. One of the Iron Age hill forts was here at Maiden Castle, near Dorchester. 
you can still see the massive protective ditch system that surrounded the tribal settlement on top. When the Romans attacked, it must have been a battle royal, because when archaeologists dug up the site some 19 centuries later, they found grisly evidence of what looked like an Iron Age war cemetery. Some of that evidence is in the Dorset County Museum. Well, I've heard about the Dioroptrigaes, I've read about them, but I'm really excited to meet two of them in person. Unfortunately, these two young men died in what appears to have been the battle for Maiden Castle. This chap, down near the bottom of his spine, roughly where his belly button would have been, he stopped what looks like an arrow. It's come in through the front and lodged in his spine. It's the most terrible injury. It would certainly have killed him within a few minutes. And this chap, in the side of his skull, just near his left ear, is an extraordinary square hole. It looks as if it's been cut. And the great archaeologist Sir Mortimer Wheeler reckons he may have stopped a ballista bolt. And Maiden Castle wasn't the only place where Roman artillery was decisive. 25 miles away, the same tribe had another well-defended settlement on the top of Hod Hill. That too fell to Vespasian's army. Now the Romans attacked up this, the southeast slope. And I reckon they must have built a siege tower just about where that fence is, a few yards down the hill, because they used their artillery from there to get right across these massive great ramparts, deep ditch, high walls, and attack the chieftain's hut, which was up there on the skyline, about 150 metres away. And this is the very site of the chieftain's hut. We know it because it was the biggest one in the whole camp. When archaeologists dug down here, they found a whole mass of ballista bolts, both inside the hut and in the entrance. Now, to anyone who was used to nothing more powerful than a bow and arrow, this terrifying barrage must have been absolutely mind-blowing. The theory is that the ballista won the Battle of Hod Hill, but I want to find out whether it really has the range and accuracy. We've marked out the distance between the siege tower and the chieftain's hut, and Alan Wilkins and Len Morgan have brought down a ballista from Lunt. The question is, given this terrific headwind, can you stick three or four ballista bolts in that chieftain's hut 150 metres away? We can well, certainly okay. give it a try, can't we? OK, well, I'm going to stand back because I don't fancy stopping one of those things. <laughs> Carry on. Yep. Try this for a ranging shot. Yankee Dad! Wow! Where was it? It was just as, oh, slightly to the left of centre, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It was dead on the target. Did, but, uh, did it hit or did it just go over? Well, I, I thought it went slightly over. Slightly, but over, slightly over. Very yeah. slightly so over. So down top. a smidge then. Yankee Dad! Yankee Dad! Right from the start, it's clear that the ballista has the range to cross the widest of Iron Age ramparts and ditches. Yagita! And after a few ranging shots, Yagita. Len's aim is getting more and more accurate. Get on yeah. target! Hey, oh, terrific! Well yeah, terrific! Well, that was fantastic shooting, Len. Look, one absolutely spot in the middle there, absolutely right in the middle. And, and there's a hole there. Split. I reckon there was another one very close to the centre. Yeah, in fact, you can see it. The bolt's it's right there. there. Yeah. And there was one that ricocheted off the top and must be just a little way behind somewhere. Yeah. And then we've got three more, one, two, two three. three more right here. Yeah. So that if this was the door of the chieftain's hut, he'd be pretty terrified. And I would have thought he'd have surrendered the camp quite quickly, really. I wouldn't want to have these things coming crashing in. Now, there's a bit of a problem with this machine they've been using, the Scorpion. It takes about 20 seconds to reload. You can only fire about three bolts a minute. But amazingly, there is an account in the ancient literature of a machine that repeated, that fired like a repeating ballista. The Roman troops didn't really need the repeating ballista to conquer Britain. 
their standard weaponry and military tactics were enough. Within 20 years of their arrival, there seemed to be no way of stopping Britain from becoming part of the largest empire in the world. Once the Romans had established their new colony in Britain, they needed to be able to bring in more troops and supplies, and so the port of Dover became a major gateway, as it still is. By day, it was easy to find from the sea because of those huge white cliffs on both sides of the harbour, but at night it was more difficult. So in order to guide the ships in, they built two huge lighthouses, one on that headland and one here on top of the cliffs, and it's still here. This is the original Roman Pharos, now unfortunately hemmed in by these much more modern buildings. And you can see the top's fallen off and was replaced in the Middle Ages, but the bottom half is still Roman, and originally it was 25 metres high. A lookout on the top of the Pharos would have been well placed to check on the Roman fleet out there in the channel. It must have been fantastic at night because they lit this great wood fire on the top of the Pharos. This wonderful beacon must have been visible from France where more Roman soldiers are waiting, trembling with fear. And perhaps, perhaps it gave them the idea that Britain wasn't quite such a frightening place as they'd been led to believe. The ancient Egyptian civilization was just as important as the Roman and spanned 3,000 years. If you're a digital satellite viewer, then press red to hone your ancient Egyptian history. We're back with the Romans next.